Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to speak to your treasured possessions and give them this information that you have instructed me to do so. I pray that they will receive it the way that you want them to and that prayers will become bigger and that faith will become stronger. Dear Father, I ask these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I decided to do a part one of this video talking about some supernatural abilities in the Old Testament. I decided to do it in more than one part because it would take me too long to do it all in one video and it, the video would be way too long as well. So this part just explains the Old Testament and what I'm going to be talking about is just extraordinary abilities that many people have not considered when they've re read the Bible. You know, things like Portal, going in and out of portals and, you know, all kind of uh, transport devices and things of this nature and, you know, being transformed without a rapture and, and things of that nature. So I'm going to get right into it. I'm going to talk about Enoch first. And, you know, Enoch was a guy that walked with God. Enoch walked with God for 300 years until God just took him. According to the book of Enoch, he was also transported many times, went through portals, foretold the future, and was in an angelic transport house, similar to what Elijah explained as a chariot of fire. Many people believe this to be some type of alien aircraft, you know, um, and then he also went in and out different portals. Enoch describes portal transport clearly in the book of Enoch chapter 14, 8 through 12. And this is just uh, reading that. A vision thus appeared to me, unto, to me. Behold, in that vision, clouds and a mist invited me, agitated stars and flashes of lightning impelled and pressed me forwards, while winds in the vision assisted my flight, accelerating my progress. They elevated me aloft to heaven. I proceeded until I arrived at a wall built with stones of crystal. A vibrating flame surrounded it, which began to strike me with terror. Into this vibrating flame I entered. Okay, so, you know, many people think of that as a, a, a portal in itself right there or some kind of aircraft, but he's going to actually say the word portal. So this is verse 12. And drew nigh to a spacious habitation built also with stones of crystal crystal its walls too as well as pavement were formed with stones of crystal and crystal likewise was the ground its roof had the appearance of agitated stars and flashes of lightning and among them were cherubim of fire in a stormy sky a flame burned around its walls and its portal so that's the word portal, blaze with fire. When I entered into this dwelling, it was hot as fire and cold as ice. No trace of lightning or of life was there. Okay, so in this one passage, you can hear that he is describing this type of um, air, this aircraft that is like, um, uh, uh, we wouldn't, I wouldn't use the word alien you know, because this is actually a holy angel type of aircraft. When we get into Elijah, you will hear the same type of thing. Enoch and Elijah actually experienced a lot of the same things. Okay, I along with my children and several others have had prophetic dreams where we have seen portals in our, in our dreams. And in the Psalms, David is explaining portals, especially when he says ancient doors in this scripture in Psalms 24 and 7. He says, lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Okay, so um, it is believed that, that that is him talking about different portals. It is important to note that you must close portals, doors, gates um, to all evil, i.e. demons and devils. 
And we do this by anointing our, our homes. I have done a video on how to anoint your home that I will put in the description box. You can do a separate study on the doors of heaven, the windows of heaven, and the gates of heaven to learn more about these portals. I would have to do a separate video that would go into more detail about these portals because I can spend a lot of time going throughout the Bible alone, just pointing out, you know, different portals and uh, things of that nature. But it, it would make this video way too long. So I'm just going to go head on. You know, Enoch was also translated to God. And I want to make sure I, I explain that because many people in the New Testament, a lot of people don't even read the Old Testament, which is really sad. And they really should. Because a person that is well versed in the Old Testament, when a person uh, talks or preaches anything, we can easily tell that they don't know the Old Testament. It, it shows in the things that they say. So you really should study the Old Testament. And I, I want to say this early on too. Please do not go and read the book of Enoch, the book of Joshua, those two books I do believe in, unless you really know the Old Testament really, really well, because you won't understand those books. I, I would really admonish you all not to do that. And I have had people jump and go and do that. And then they, they have contacted me with a lot of questions because they don't understand what they're reading. So I'm telling you, please really get a good understanding of the Old Testament before you go read those books. Okay, so Enoch, the, the, you know, the Bible says that no one ascended into heaven. Okay, so a lot of people like myself who have been to heaven, you know, um, my youngest daughter has been to heaven and other prophets have been to heaven. They say, no, you haven't because no one has ascended into heaven. Okay, but Enoch did not ascend into heaven either. Okay, Enoch was translated to God. The Bible says he was translated. The Bible says Jesus ascended. So there is a difference between translation and ascension, uh, ascending to God. Those two things are different. Okay. Um, translated means to move from one place or condition to another. In terms of the physical body, it means to cause a body to move so, so that all of its parts travel in the same direction without rotation or change of shape. Okay, Hebrews 11 and 5 says, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him for before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. Okay, so there is a difference and you need to understand that. And that is very similar to what they, you know, have shown in, you know, like Star Trek movies of when you see them going to this device and they're translated into a different world. Okay, that is what Enoch experienced. And um, that is what a lot of us have seen in our dreams coming in the end days as well. These type of, you know, portals and, and translation into, you know, different areas. Okay. And, um, Shem, you know, Shem is also known as Melchizedek, um, and spelt another way, um, Melchizedek with a C. And I know a lot of people don't agree with that. You know, I understood that from just reading the Bible alone, but if you go and read the book of Jasher, it makes it perfectly clear as well that, the Shem is Melchizedek. And I'm going to really explain that because I know that that's probably going over the heads of some people right now. So Noah had three sons. He had Shem, Ham, and Japheth. It was the line of Shem that the Israelites would later come through, as well as other uh, famous biblical characters that we know and love, such as Abraham, Moses, Jeremiah, the disciples, etc. You know, Jesus Christ himself comes from this line through Shem. According to the book of Joshua, Shem is Melchizedek. Melchizedek, also uh, known in the Bible as Melchizedek with a C, was the king of Salem, okay, which means the king of peace. Salem was also a physical place in which Shem acquired. He was a high priest, okay. Abraham paid tithes to him. Abraham was also blessed by him. So those things are all very evident in the book of, of Joshua. And they're evident in the Bible as well. I don't even have to go to the book of Joshua to point that out. Okay, um, Genesis 14, 19 says, And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. 
So this is Shem blessing uh, Abram. So, and you know, Shem was a high priest because a lot of people don't recognize the significance of Shem being a high priest. They know most Christians, well, I don't know about most, but a lot of Christians know that to them, the first high priest was Levi from, no, I take that back. They don't even know. They, they will say Aaron. They will say Aaron from the time of Moses that it was Aaron. Okay, Aaron is after Shem by hundreds and hundreds of years, okay? But Shem was a high priest. And I'm I'm really going to explain this, why this is significant. And and the Bible says also how Abram paid his tithes to Shem. Okay, he paid tithes to Shem. And when it talks about Melchizedek, it talks about as the person that Abraham paid his tithes into, paid his tithes to. I'm actually not going to quote any scriptures out of the book of Joshua. I'm only quoting the Bible. Genesis 14, 18. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the most high God. Okay. He was a high priest way before Moses. Okay. Hebrews 7. And, and please read the whole book of Hebrews 7, but I'm only going to point out three, three verses, one through three. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the most high God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like, focus on the word like, unto the Son of God, abided a priest continually. Okay? So Jesus came into the world through the tribe of Judah. We know that. The Bible tells us in Matthew that his father's side, Joseph, and his mother's side, if you trace the genealogy, it traces through the lineage of, of the tribe of Judah through David on both sides of his family. Okay. However, the order of the priesthood came through Jacob's son, Levi, not Judah. Okay. So in order for Jesus to be a high priest, he had to be under the order of an earlier ancestor before the Levitical priesthood. So Jesus was not a Levite. He was not of the tribe of Levi. So he couldn't be a high priest under Levi is what I'm trying to say. So he had to go before that. And that was through this lineage of Shem. Okay. A lot of people read Genesis 14 and three, when it, when it says without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the son of God, abided a priest continually. They think that because it says that, that it's saying that this is God. Okay. I, I strongly disagree with that. Um, because it's just saying that God made Shem like a son of God. He, he like, it was a superpower. He made this, this Shem, this high priest, like a son of God, but he was not a son of God. Okay. He, he was Shem and he was Melchizedek and Jesus high priesthood is coming through this Shem because Shem and Shem was not just a regular high priest. He was a supernatural high priest, like the son of God. I hope that makes sense. But if not, you know, I don't want to go on and on about this, the whole video, because it'll just make this video way too long. So um, I'm going to go into Abraham now. Okay. Abraham had um, what most of us already know of is a gift of faith. You know, through faith, Abraham believed that Yahweh would give him a son after waiting for nearly 45 years. Through faith, Abraham offered up to Yahweh his only begotten son um, of his wife, Sarah. And, you know, faith is a gift. The Bible tells us it's a, it is a gift of the, uh, of the spirit um, that Abraham had. Abraham had it very well. In 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 9, the Bible says, but the manifestation of the spirit is given to every man to profit with all for to one is given by the spirit of the word of wisdom to another, the word of knowledge by the same spirit to another faith by the same spirit to another, 
the gift of healing by the same spirit. And then in Genesis 22, 1 through 3, it says, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass, his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. So the reason I read that is because I wanted to make it very clear. Okay, I'm not going to go over Mary, but Abraham and Mary, who um, was the mother of Jesus Christ on the earth, had two things uh, in common, and they aren't the only ones, but I, I love that, that God told them to do something radical, you know, and he comes to Abraham, hey, I want you to kill your son. Hey, Abraham just gets up early in the next day, and he says, okay, it's time to time for him to die. You know, he didn't, he didn't question God. He had this gift of faith. His faith in God was so strong that he did not go back and forth with God. Well, I don't know. Can I get some, you know, clarification or, you know, things like that. And then when Gabriel comes to Mary later in, in uh, the New Testament and tells her, well, the Holy Ghost is going to come upon you and you're going to get pregnant. You're going to be pregnant. You know, this is some radical, crazy stuff. She says, do as thou wilt, you know, uh, do as thou wilt. And basically that is what the Satanists are copying off. Every time they say, do as thou wilt, they're really copying off Mary. They're making a mockery of it, of course, because she's saying it to, to um, the angel of God and as if she's saying it to God himself through her faith. Her faith is that strong. Do as thou wilt. They're saying it about their own self. You know, they're saying, you know, we're going to do what we want to do. But that's another story. But anyway. You know, I want you all to be encouraged to pray for this gift, pray for the gift of faith, you know, this strongly that when the Lord speaks to you, you can say, do as thou wilt and go on. Okay. We also know that Abraham had a gift of prophets, prophecy. He was a prophet that could pray away curses off people. Okay. Genesis 26 through seven tells us, and God said unto him in a dream, yea, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart. For I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. Now this is talking about God uh, talking to King Abimelech because he was going to marry Sarah and, you know, consummate the marriage because he thought that Sarah was Abraham, Abraham's sister, which in reality she was his sister removed. So he didn't lie when he told King Abimelech that he just neglected to tell him that that was his wife. And without going further into the story, God is just telling King Abimelech, you know, I did not curse you because I know that you didn't know that that was his wife. Okay. in verse seven, now, therefore restore the man, his wife, for he is a prophet. He shall pray for thee and thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, know thou that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are thine. Okay, and later Abraham prays for them and they're healed. But what I really want to point out, the fact is that God could have healed him himself. But God says no. So you see how God is using his people. He says, Abraham will pray for you. And then we know in the New Testament when, when Paul, well, his, his name was Saul at first, he's blind and he sends him to someone to be healed instead of God healing him himself. So God uses his people, you know, so I'm going to go on. You know, Abraham also had many visitations of the Lord. The Lord appeared unto Abram, Abram um, as well. So, you know, we, we, and you can read Genesis 12 and 7 about that. Um, Abraham was um, a person that had different visitations and open dialogue with the Lord. Now, I have to point this out because very few of us can say, I know I cannot say that. I have never had the Lord visit me and have open dialogue with him. You know, I've never experienced that. I have had the Lord visit me before, you know, glory to the living God. 
but usually, um, you know, I'm, it, it, my spirit is responding to him. Well, I don't know unless their spirit was responding to him as well, but wow, I never really thought about that, but I, I consciously in my own mind as, as a, you know, it's, it's hard to explain this. You know, we have a soul, we have a spirit consciously. Did I respond to him and have open dialogue with the Lord? I don't think I've ever experienced anything like Abraham and later what we'll see with Moses. So this is a really big deal to me because when I listen to people, I listen for that. Do they really, you know, if the Lord visited them, do they have open dialogue with him? Because that is the highest level of prophecy that you can have, I do believe now. And I I will point out scripture as to why I believe that. I want to almost say I know that, but I'll point that out later, not right now. But that is a, a really high level. You know, lots of us have dreams and visions, but when you can actually have open dialogue with God. Okay, so three men appeared before Abraham. The scripture refers to them as the Lord and men. The Lord tells Abraham his future, that God will make him a great nation. The Lord also tells him the future plans to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. During these declarations, Abraham communes with the Lord face to face. So how many of us can actually say we've communed with God face to face? You know, that is, that's amazing. I, I've never experienced anything like that. that. That is amazing. Usually if the Lord visits me, I usually don't say anything at all. He, he talks and, and every blue moon I have had maybe twice in my life where my spirit has spoken, but not necessarily me. So. I don't know. And I, and not an open dialogue conversation, you know, like, you know, we have a conversation. That's really high level. Okay. Abraham also experienced different visions. He had a vision of the word of the Lord. So he, he probably saw uh, Jesus as a silhouette or, or something like a, a glory cloud as the Lord um, spoke to him. So, you know, you can read Genesis 15 and one about that. And, um, you know, Abraham had something else that most people are not aware of. Abraham was a man of great strength and stamina and courage, you know, um, which I compare to the Braveheart movie. Okay, there is a famous slaughter of the kings. In this slaughter of the kings in in the Bible, Abraham, along with only 318 servants, not mighty men, not um, people trained for war, defeated four kings and their massive armies. The kings that they defeated were previously undefeated in battles against five other kings and their their armies. Abraham and his small army smote them so bad that as the kings were running away, they pursued them and smote them some more. Okay? So Abraham faced a vast, unstoppable military force of four kings with only 318 men. But with God, that was all he needed. God is able to give a a trusting and obedient minority victory over ungodly forces that are overwhelmingly superior in numbers. Here's the lesson Zechariah 4 and 6 says, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Okay, so and I know that many people have had dreams of this where they have been in these small armies up against, you know, a great force of demons in the tribulation. I cannot say personally that I have had that experience, but I know many that have. Okay, so Isaac, you know, Isaac was a man of great faith. According to the book of Joshua, Isaac at one point figured out that Abraham was going to sacrifice him. Okay. He knew that and he believed in God so much that he was willing to lay down his life for the fulfillment of the sacrificial offering to the Lord. He did not run or complain. Glory to God, you know. However, we know that God later told Abraham to sacrifice a lamb instead of Isaac. And Isaac was also a man of of prophecy. Isaac foresees into the future when he prophesies over his sons, Jacob and Esau, In the prophecies, he is also foretelling of the end days. And you can go and read that in Genesis 27 verses 26 through 40. Okay, so uh, Jacob, you know, Isaac's son, Jacob. 
Jacob was a man with a supernatural ability of prophetic dreams. He dreamed the famous story we know of as Jacob's letter, which is really a portal from earth to heaven. Throughout the ages, many have tried to locate this portal unsuccessfully. And you can read about that in Genesis 28, 12 through 16. Okay, so there is another portal story. But like I said, there's so many in the Bible. It, I, I will have to do a separate video to really, really point that out. It's just so many of them. Jacob was also a man who had visitations from God, you know, um, or angels from God and angels, actually. We know from scripture that Jacob is the man that wrestled with God till daybreak to receive a blessing. Okay. You can read about that in Genesis 32. Okay. And Jacob also was known for seeing into the future. You can read about that in Genesis 49. He gathers his sons to him and he, he, he sees into the future, you know, and that's pretty much what a lot of prophecy is. We're foretelling of things to come to pass in the future. But Jacob was also a man that was very gifted with a bow and an arrow, okay? According to the book of Joshua, Jacob was the first man that was supernaturally skilled at using a bow and arrow. During a battle against his sons, he slew several kings on the opposing side with accuracy. He never missed a target. So the book of Joshua chapter 28, starting at verse 1, says this, And Ahuri, king of Shiloh, came up to assist Elon and he approached Jacob. When Jacob drew his bow that was in his hand and with an arrow struck Ahiri, which caused his death. And when Ahiri, king of Shiloh, was dead, the four remaining kings fled from their station with the rest of, their, of the captains. And they endeavored to retreat, saying, We have no strength with the Hebrews after their, after their having killed the three kings and their captains who were more powerful than are we. And when the kings of Jacob saw that the remaining kings had removed from their station, they pursued them. And Jacob also came from the heap of Shechem, from the place where he was standing. And they went after the kings, and they approached them with their servants. With their servants. I love how the people of God use servants in battles, okay? Verse 4. And the kings and the captains with the rest of their army, seeing that the sons of Jacob approached them, were afraid of their lives and fled till they reached the city of Chazar. And the sons of Jacob pursued them to the gate of the city of Chazar and smote a great smiting against the kings and their armies, about 4,000 men. And whilst they were smiting the army of the kings, Jacob was occupied with his bow confining himself to smiting the kings, and he slew them all. Okay, he was supernaturally skilled with that bow. And verse 46 says, And Jacob approached and drew his bow, and came nigh unto the mighty men, and, and slew three of their men with the bow, and the remaining eight turned back, and behold, and behold, the war raged against them in the front and the rear, and they were greatly afraid of their lives and could not stand before the sons of Jacob, and they fled from before them. So, you know, that's just touching on another thing as well about um, the sons of Jacob, but I'll, I'm going to actually go into that right now. So I had to add this part. After I had already recorded Jacob, I was reading the Bible with my daughters and the Lord led me to Genesis 29 and he was showing me how Jacob was also extremely strong. So I recommend that you all please read Genesis 29 verses 1 through 10. But I'm just going to read verse 10 at this time. And it came to pass when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. Okay, so this is very significant because if you read the Bible, if you read those scriptures, you know, like I was saying, the Bible says in verse 2 that that was a great stone. And it also paints a picture as it was a whole lot of people that was waiting, you know, for all the flock to come in, for them to 
moved this stone. And it literally said in the Bible, they, it refers to a, they moving this stone, but Jacob comes over just one man and he moves this stone. So this is the type of hidden, hidden knowledge in the word of God that I'm going to be pointing out in this video. And God himself has helped me out with a lot of scriptures supernaturally throughout this video. He's literally like even quoted scriptures to me and told me where to go in the Bible to, to find this information. So I was pretty, pretty shocked by this. So anyway, yeah, he was supernaturally strong. We're going into his sons right now. And you're going to um, start seeing, you know, that they were supernaturally strong as well. It wasn't just Samson. So Jacob, we know, had 12 sons. His sons were known for their strength, their stamina, their super speed, their wisdom, you know, seeing the future, the, the priesthood, you know, Levi was a high priest, their kingship, okay? To really understand the supernatural abilities of the 12 sons of Jacob, you should read the Bible along with the book of Joshua and the testaments of the 12 sons of Jacob written at the time of their deaths. Okay, here is one passage where Judah was talking to Joseph. At the time, Judah did not know that Joseph was his brother, but Joseph was holding Benjamin hostage. So Judah is threatening him in this passage. And this is in the book of jo Joshua, chapter 54, 60 through 61. Dost thou not know? Or hast thou not heard that our father Abraham with his servant Eleazar smote all the kings of Elam with a host in one night? They left not, not one remaining. And ever since that day, our father's strength was given unto us for an inheritance for us and our seed forever. And Joseph answered and said, you speak truth and falsehood is not in your mouth. For it was also told unto you that the Hebrews have power and that the Lord their God delighted much in them. And who then can stand before them? Okay. Just mighty, mighty, mighty men of strength. If you know, when you, you, you know the Old Testament well and then you read the book of Joshua, you'll see that the strength of the 12 sons of Jacob, it was like they were. Samson, you know, just uh, a whole bunch of Samsons, the 12 sons of Jacob. It's amazing. Okay. You know, Jacob's sons, along with their servants, 112 men total, only 112 men. Okay. And they're, they going around just smiting everybody. They destroyed the armies of various kingdoms in one war period. The following Canaanite kings and kingdoms were destroyed in one battle. Shechem, um, in one battle, Shechem, uh, Tapnach, and all the kingdoms that surrounded them, and the uh, um, Amorites, okay? So you can read about those great battles. I mean, just 112 men total, just, you know, like 100. Well, not all of them was, was like Samson, but the sons of Jacob were, and that changed the, the course of the, of the uh, battles that they were in. Okay, Simeon and Levi. And this is also in the in the Bible as well. You can read about these um, stories in the Word of God. But in their first recorded battle, by their strength, Simeon and Levi destroyed the whole town of Shechem alone, where the men there were recovering from being circumcised. They were also extremely good with using a sword. Shechem was said to be a large city. Okay, so here's this really large city, but yet these two brothers, not, they didn't even have their servants with them, just two brothers. They smote everybody, everybody. Okay, and we know that Levi also had the gift of a priesthood. He was a high priest, and he was actually the first high priest uh, after Shem. Okay, so um, you can read about this in Genesis 34, um, Genesis 49, Deuteronomy 18. You know, it just talks um, more about this, okay? And then Judah, I love Judah. Judah, Judah was, he had the gift of kingship. We know in Genesis 49 that, that he was given a prophecy by his father, Jacob, for his kingship in verses 8 through 12. And he had kingship over the other tribes of the Israelites. Judah also has supernatural strength. And I have to read this out of the book of Joshua chapter 54, starting at verse one. And when Judah saw the dealings of Joseph with them, 
Judah approached him and broke open the door and came with his brethren before Joseph. So this has to do with when Joseph was holding Benjamin hostage. And at the time, Judah didn't know that Joseph was his brother yet. Dost thou not know what two of my brethren, Simeon and Levi, did unto the city of Shechem and unto seven cities of the Amorites on account of our sister Dinah? And also what they would do for the sake of their brother Benjamin. And I with my strength, who am greater and mightier than both of them, came this day upon thee and thy land, if thou art unwilling to send our brother. And Judah said unto Joseph, Surely it becometh thee and thy people to fear me, as the Lord liveth. If I once draw my sword, I shall not sheath it again until I shall this day have slain all Egypt and I will commence with thee and finish with Pharaoh, thy master. So Judah is telling him, haven't you heard? We're so strong and mighty. Are you kidding me? We'll smite you all. I'll start with killing you until I've killed everyone in Egypt up until Pharaoh. Cause he, he is, you know, full of strength. Okay. Verse 27. And Joseph answered and said, such is your custom to do as you did to your brother whom you sold. So Joseph is talking about himself. You know, he sold him before. But once again, Judah doesn't know yet that Joseph is his brother. And you dipped his coat in blood and brought it to your father in order that he might say an evil beast devoured him. And here is his blood. And when Judah heard this thing, he was exceedingly wroth. And his anger burned within him. And there was before him in the place a stone, the weight of which was about 400 shekels. And Judah's anger was kindled. And he took the stone in one hand and cast it to the heavens and caught it with his left hand. And he placed it afterward under his legs. And he set upon it with all his strength. And the stone was turned into dust from the force of Judah. And Joseph was, saw the act of Judah, and he was very much afraid. But he commanded Manasseh, his son, and he did uh, with another stone like unto the act of Judah. And Judah said unto his brethren, Let not any of you say this man is an Egyptian, but by his doing this thing, he is of our father's family. So what is going on here? Judah is so strong. He takes this huge stone. He throws it up into the sky, way up into the sky, comes down, catches it. Okay, that's like catching a cannon. No matter of fact, that's like catching 10 cannons. He catches this thing. He puts it underneath him and he sits on it and grinds it to powder. He's that strong. Okay, so just get a feel of how strong these these sons of, of Jacob were. Okay, and then Manasseh, which is the son of Joseph, which is also, you know, he's uh, the grandchild of Jacob. He does the same thing. So you see this supernatural strength early on in these children of Jacob in with the Israelites. Now, I will have to do a separate video, which I could, and I can go into, you know, some of the things that have taken place throughout the thousands of years to make, you know, people not as strong, the, such as chemtrails and things that they've done to the food and, you know, things to mess up our DNA and, you know, different people's DNA that um, would have been strong and, and sin in general and sin's effect on the world and starting with Adam and how it affected the earth and, you know, how it's affecting people, you know, even with Samson, he, he disobeyed God and he lost his strength. So, you know, but that's another video. Okay. Verse 38. And Judah said, behold, I will destroy the, I will destroy three of the streets with my strength and you shall each destroy one street. And when Judah was speaking this thing, behold, the inhabitants of Egypt and all mighty men came toward them with all sorts of musical instruments and with loud shouting. So Judah is saying that he is going to kill three streets worth of people just on his own. Just three streets. I'll take three streets. 
you all take one apiece. So Judah is, is saying in this too, that he's stronger than all his brethren. Okay. But his brethren are pretty strong too, to take a whole street of mighty men. And these was really mighty Egyptians that was coming to him in this battle. So Judah also had a supernatural sonic scream. According to the book of Joshua, Judah's scream was so powerful that it would cause earthquakes as well as change the course of the war they were in because the men would tremble in terror, causing them to lose focus and flee in terror. Okay, so um, book of Joshua chapter 54, starting at verse uh, 41. And when the sons of Jacob saw the, these troops, they were greatly afraid of their lives. And Joseph did so in order to terrify the sons of Jacob to become tranquil. And Judah, seeing some of his brethren terrified, said unto them, Why are you afraid whilst the grace of God is with us? And when Judah saw all the people of Egypt surrounding them at the command of Joseph to terrify them, only Joseph commanded them, saying, Do not touch any of them. Then Judah hastened and drew his sword and uttered a loud and bitter scream, and he smote with his, his sword. And he sp sprang upon the ground and he still continued to shout against all the people. And when he did this thing, the Lord caused the terror of Jake, Judah and his brethren to fall upon the valiant men and the, all the people that surrounded them. And they all fled at the sound of the shouting and they were terrified and fell one upon the another, one upon the other. The many of them died as they fell, and they all fled from before Judah and his brethren and from before Joseph. And whilst they were fleeing, Judah and his brethren pursued them unto the house of Pharaoh, and they all escaped. And Judah again sat before Joseph and roared at him like a lion and gave a great and tremendous shriek at him. And the shriek was heard at a distance. And all the inhabitants of Sukkot heard it, and all Egypt quaked at the sound of the shriek, and also the walls of Egypt and the land of Goshen fell in from the shaking of the earth. And Pharaoh also fell from his throne upon the ground, and also all the pregnant women of Egypt and Goshen miscarried when they heard the noise of the shaking, for they were terribly afraid. And they came and told Joseph all the words of Pharaoh that he had said concerning him. And they came and told Joseph all the words of Pharaoh that he had said concerning him. And Joseph was greatly afraid at the words of Pharaoh. And Judah and his brethren were still standing before Joseph, indignant and enraged. And all the sons of Jacob roared at Joseph like the roaring of the sea and its waves. Okay. So this is very significant because the Bible tells us, and it's talking about the, the people that God will use in the end days. And whether you want to call that the 144,000, the saints, I don't know what you want to call it. But the Bible talks about this group of people in the Old Testament where it says that they will be like lions. They will be like young lions. They will, they will be roaring. The Bible says they will roar. Okay, this is some of the type of roaring that they will do. Their roaring will cause earthquakes. It will cause, you know, people to flee in terror. Okay, people will be afraid for their lives. You see, this, this sonic scream that Judah had was so powerful that even the women miscarried. Okay. So these are some of the abilities that we can look forward to seeing come to pass in the end days. Another son of Jacob, and I'm not going to go over all the sons of Jacob. You know, you can read Genesis 49 to get a good idea as to what kind of abilities that they had. As you see how Jacob prophesies over his sons before he died. So I'm only just pointing out a couple of them. So Naphtali was one and he was known for his sword speed um, and his supernatural speed okay naphtali has supernatural sword speed the book of joshua tells us in chapter 38 and four mighty men experienced in battle went forth from the city and stood against the entrance of the city and drew swords and spears in their hands 
and they placed themselves opposite the sons of Jacob and would not suffer them to enter the city. And Naphtali ran and came between them and with his sword smote two of them and cut off their heads at one stroke. And he turned to the other two and behold, they had fled and he pursued them, overtook them, smote them and slew them. Okay, so he was quick with the sword. Okay, he also, Naphtali also has supernatural speed. Genesis 49 and 21 tells us, this is Jacob talking about his son. He says, Naphtali is a hind let loose. He give it goodly words. So what is a hind? A hind is one of the quickest animals in the animal kingdom. And that's what Jacob is calling his son. And that just gives truth to what is recorded in the book of Joshua chapter 54, starting in verse 33. And Judah spake, spoke to his brother Naphtali, and he said unto him, Make haste, go now and number all the streets of Egypt, and come and tell me. And Simeon said unto him, Let not this thing be a trouble to thee. Now I will go to the mount and take up one large stone from the mount and level it at every one in Egypt and kill all that are in it. Let me just point that out real quick. Um, it's not talking about Naphtali, but it is talking about Simeon. You can see the strength that he has. He says, hey, you know what? Don't be too troubled. You know, I got this. I'm going to go get this giant stone and just throw it down and, and just kill, just level uh, Egypt, you know, because he's there that strong. OK, well, OK, back to Naphtali at verse 34. And Joseph heard all these words that his brethren spoke before him. And they did not know that Joseph understood them, for they imagined that he knew not to speak Hebrew. And Joseph was greatly afraid at the words of his brethren, lest they should destroy Egypt. And he commanded his son Manasseh, saying, Go now, make haste, and gather unto me all the inhabitants of Egypt and all the valiant men together, and let them come to me now upon horseback, and on foot, and with all sorts of musical instruments. And Manasseh went and did so. And Naphtali went as Judah had commanded him, for Naphtali was light-footed as one, as, as one of the swift stakes, and he would go upon the ears of corn, and they would not break under him. And he went and numbered all the streets of Egypt, and found them to be twelve. And he came hastily and told Judah, and Judah said unto his brother, and hasten you, and put on every man his sword upon his loins, and we will come over Egypt and smite them all, and let not one remnant remain. So what is important to note here? It says in verse 36, Naphtali was light footed, okay? And it says that he would run so fast when he would run on the ears of corn, they would not even break. That's supernatural speed. That is not na that is not normal speed. That is supernatural speed. Okay, and I have had dreams where I could fly really, really fast. The Lord has given me dreams where He's going to use me in the end days. I've seen it, and I could I could fly at a super, super duper speed. Uh, you know, like a speed of lightning. And I've heard other people say that they can run re really fast. I may have had a dream where I can run really fast too. I honestly can't remember. But I know I remember the one I can fly really, really fast. And I said, man, I, I think I can fly better than, faster than Superman. So, um, yeah, I mean, great uh, supernatural abilities are coming in the end days. A lot of people don't want to believe that. That's between them and God. I'm not going to argue with them. You know, um, maybe God has not shown them these things because he's not going to be using them um, like he's going to be using some other people. But God has shown me a lot of it and many, many others. So, Joseph. You know, Joseph was a man, um, we know, um, he had great strength and stamina and he was good with a bow. And, you know, we know that from Jacob's prophecy to him in Genesis 49, you can go and read that. Um, and then also Joseph's son's ability to get a person enraged at peace. His son Manasseh, we talked about before at the supernatural strength because he was in a family but Manasseh also had an ability that very few, and I have heard it before, um, have had. I've never done a video about this, but the Lord showed me because I'm going to be on a team of people working in the end days. And one person on my team has the ability 
to take people that are enraged and like change their mind. Like I saw that this person was enraged and coming at us to kill us. And she commanded him some kind of way with her ability that God gave him her. And, and this guy turned around and began to go towards the enemy instead of coming at us. Okay. Joseph's son Manasseh had an ability like that. The book of Joshua tells us in chapter 54, starting at 53. And Joseph commanded his son Manasseh and Manasseh went and approached Judah and placed his hand upon his shoulder and the anger of Judah was stilled. Okay. And Judah said unto his brethren, let no one of you say that this act is an Egyptian youth, for this is the work of my father's house. And Judah seeing and knowing that Judah's anger was stilled, he approached to speak unto Judah in the language of mountainous. So what this is saying, we just heard how Judah is so enraged. He's throwing up giant boulders into the sky and sitting on them, um, uh, uh, grinding them to dust. He's, you know, screaming to the point of people are having miscarriages and earthquakes are happening. And, you know, it's just all kind of crazy stuff. Judah is enraged. Manasseh just goes up to him, put his hands on his shoulder, calms him, and he steals him. And he, he, Judah is like, what on earth? This is no way this guy's an Egyptian. He's got to be one of us. He's got to be. And he is, but he doesn't know it yet. So yeah, you know, this ability is coming. I've seen it. And then, you know, Joseph could also see into the future. We know from the Bible that Joseph is first said to have dreamed a dream of his brethren and father bowing to him. In this dream, he was foretelling the future. He later is seen as a dream interpreter during his stand in Egypt, where he interprets the baker and the cook's dreams and later Pharaoh's dreams after no one else in the land could interpret them. And you can go and read that in Genesis 37 and Genesis 40 and Genesis 41, you know, on your own. Moses... Moses was made a God unto Pharaoh. The Bible tells us in Exodus 7 and 1. And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a God to, uh, to Pharaoh. And Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. And I want to just pause and take a moment to talk about this. Because a lot of people think that they're, they're gods. And they use this scripture trying to say that they're gods. But that makes no sense. The Bible says that God made Moses only a God unto Pharaoh, but Aaron was made a prophet. So if, if, you know, we all supposed to be gods, why was Aaron made a prophet? But I already did a video about that before, so I'm not going to go into it too much, but I want to get into this staff, this rod that Moses had, because a lot of people know he had a staff and they know of some of the miracles, but I want to really go over all of them, which is amazing that he did with this staff. Okay, um, the, the Bible says that in Exodus 4 and 17, and thou shalt take this rod in thy hand, wherewith, wherewith thou shalt do signs. So God told him that he would do, you know, all these signs with this rod. So um, some of the things he did was he turned the rod into a serpent. Um, he used the rod to turn water into to blood. He used the rod to bring on a plague of frogs. It was used to bring on a plague of lice. He also exhibited control over flies. You know, and I've heard the Lord of the flies before, but you know, the real Lord of, well, I wouldn't call him the Lord of the flies, but <laughs> he did have control over flies, Moses. He also um, brought about a plague of bulls, which is like scabs all over the skin. He also used that staff to bring on a plague of hell. It was used to bring on a plague of locusts. It was used to even bring on three days of darkness. So a lot of extraordinary things with the staff that he had. And I want to read on this one with the three days of darkness. Exodus 10 21 through 23. And the Lord said unto Moses, stretch out thine hand towards heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness that may be felt. And Moses stretched forth his hand toward heaven. And there was a thick darkness in the land of Egypt three days. 
They saw not one another, neither rose any from his place for three days, but all the children of Israel had light in their dwelling. And according to end time prophecy, we will, we will also see some darkness coming as well. This really stood out to me. I was wondering if God would, would use someone with that ability again to bring on that darkness, you know, because I didn't even know Moses did that until I was doing this research. He also used that staff to divide the Red Sea, which most people are aware of that one. He also used it to get water out of a rock. And he used it to win various battles. Okay, the Bible says in Exodus 17, 9 through 11. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men and go out, fight with Amalek, Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let his hand, when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. So this rod is that powerful. Can you imagine? He holds it up and they're, they're winning. He puts it down, they start losing. So they actually came over Aaron and some others and they prompted his hand up to be able to rest it so he can keep that staff lifted up in the sky. So just imagine having a staff like that. I know of one person who has had multiple dreams of God giving him a supernatural staff in the end days. And that's amazing. I haven't seen that personally, but wow. Okay, that's all I can say is wow. Later, Moses is told to take the rod, but only speak to a rock. And I want to talk about this because after all these great things that Moses do does with this rod, he's no longer able to use the rod because of this. And I need to point this out because as God gives us more and more abilities, okay? And like I've said in other videos, I know people with extraordinary abilities right now. I will never tell their secrets, but I've had multiple people reach out to me and um, I've seen these things exhibited and I know that they're true. So I know people with abilities right now. Moses lost his staff. He, okay, later Moses is told to take the rod. God tells him, take the rod, but only speak to a rock to cause water to gush out to showcase God's holiness. However, Moses instead struck the rock twice with the rod to get the waters to come out. Instead of just speaking as the Lord commanded him, OK, this would have been a significant way to show the Israelites God's power without directly using the rod. This is vital because two horrific things occurred after this incident. Number one, Moses is told that he cannot go to the promised land because of his disobedience. And number two, Moses is never directed to use the rod again after his disobedience. OK, so in conclusion to this. It is important to use the gifts from the Lord as he alone directs you and never sway from his path. So yes, Moses was disobedient. He did not just speak. He went ahead and used the rod and the rod worked, but that was the last time. That was the last time God allowed that rod to work for him because of his disobedience. Okay, Numbers, and this is in Numbers 27, 12 through 15. And the Lord said unto Moses, get thee up into this mount." Abiram and see the land which I have given unto the children of Israel. And when thou hast seen it, thou shalt also be gathered unto thy people as Aaron thy brother was gathered. For ye rebelled against my commandment in the desert of Zen and the strife of the congregation to sanctify me at the water before their eyes. That is the water of Meribah in Kadesh in the wilderness of Zen. So he was disobedient. Okay. We also know that Moses displayed a power over leprosy. And then later Moses displays this power of uh, creating this image, this healing serpent replica. God instructed Moses to make a serpent replica to be used in healing people. So God wasn't done using Moses. He still went ahead and used him, but he lost his ability to use that strap, that staff. I cannot stress this enough. I know of someone personally 
who lost the ability, you know, because of disobedience. So uh, it scares me. I'm not perfect either. But, you know, when I read stuff like this, it really gets my attention because I don't want to lose any abilities that the Lord gives me. Okay, so he did make this serpent replica, and that's in Numbers 21, 8 and 9. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that every one that is bidden, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, and put it upon a pole, and it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Okay, and this is very important to, to point out because a lot of people think this is a graven image. This is not a graven image. I have had people, um, Catholics and other people, tell me that it's okay to have these images that they pray to, angels and um, you know statues of Jesus and all this kind of stuff. Or Even if you pray into a picture of Jesus, that is a graven image. An uh, image is something that you worship. If, if, you, if it's something, anything in heaven or anything in hell... Uh, anything beneath the earth, anything beneath the waters of the earth. This, these are things that are graven images, things that are being worshipped, and that is an abomination to God. And we know that also because later this serpent replica had to be destroyed because the Israelites started worshipping it. It was never created to be used for idol worship. Second Kings 18 and 4 tells us, he removed the high places and break the images and cut down the groves and break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it and he called it Nehushtan. So they gave this thing a name and started worshiping it. And because of that, the Lord had it destroyed. He, he, or, you know, it was destroyed because of that, because they were starting to worship it and they made it a graven image. It wasn't created to be a graven image. Okay. Also like Abraham before him, Moses is another man that was face to face and mouth to mouth with God. The Lord teaches us to respect people based on their gifts. A lot of people don't know that because I've had people talk really crazy to me and, um, I've seen it with other people as well. But the Lord literally does teach us to respect people based on their gift. Okay, the Bible says if someone has a prophetic gift greater than us, we should respect them more. Okay, note this does not apply to false prophets and false teachers and false preachers. Okay, they are a work of Satan, not a work of God. So, you know, I've had people try to tell me this and, and you know, well, you shouldn't be talking about this one. This one. I will point out any false prophet, false teacher, false preacher as the Lord commands me. And I have no qualms about that at all. And I, I don't care about people feelings. They need to stop telling me they feelings because I don't even respond to them. I just block them anyway, because I don't care. I answer to God and to God alone. But when you're dealing with the true saints of God, you, you should definitely respect somebody if their gift is greater than yours. The Bible tells us that this is God himself is going to be talking in Numbers 12, 6 through 10. And he said, hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so who is faithful in all mine house. So what God is saying here, he said, if there's a prophet, I will give him dreams and visions. You know, that's what prophets get. He's, but God says, Moses is not just some prophet. He's not no prophet. You know, he's greater than that. He goes on to say, verse eight, with him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently and not in dark speeches as the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Wherefore then were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them and he departed and the cloud departed from off the tabernacle and behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow and Aaron looked unto Miriam and behold, she was leprous. So what happened is Aaron and Miriam were in Moses face about his Cushite wife that he had married. And you won't get the details of that unless you read the book of Joshua. That's one of those things where if you know the Old Testament and you read the book of Joshua, it'll make sense because he did have a Cushite wife and that's explained more in there. But anyway, they were in his face about it, you know, and um, Marion was like, well, I'm a prophet too. Who do you think you are? She was comparing herself to Moses like I'm a prophet too. 
But Moses was a man who spoke to God face to face, mouth to mouth. Moses was also a man whose countenance was transformed. Okay, Moses was transformed without a rapture. And he is not the only one, as we will hear of another biblical character who did the same thing later. So, yes, I'm going to go over someone else. And, you know, I'm going to read the scripture and then I'm going to talk about how I know this even more, even even outside of the Bible. But Exodus 34, 28 through 33. And he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He did neither eat bread nor drink water. And he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. So he he fasted 40 days and 40 nights, just like Jesus did later in the New Testament. And it came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mount, that Moses wist not that the skin of of his face shone while he talked with him. And when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone and they were afraid to come nigh him. And Moses called unto them and Moses and all the rulers of the congregation returned unto him and Moses talked with them. And afterward, all the children of Israel came nigh and he gave them in commandment of all that the Lord has spoken with him in Mount Sinai until Moses had done speaking with them. He put a veil on his face. Okay. So what happened is he went up to this, this mountain. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, his hair turned white. And then his face was so bright that people could not even look at his face. They was just in fear. And you know, the only other time I've ever heard that before, and I've seen it before as well is with the Lord. You know, he appears, uh, sometimes he does appear with his face so bright, you cannot even look on his face at all. And that is the way that Moses appeared when Moses comes down from this mountain. Now I want to say that I, I, this is back before I started doing my daughter's, my youngest daughter's videos, but she went to heaven and she, this girl was in heaven for a long time. Jesus was coming and taking her to heaven every night. And this is before, you know, like I said, before I started recording it, but she saw Moses in heaven and she said in heaven that his, his hair was white and that his face was so bright that she couldn't even see the features in his face because his face was so bright. But she said that he looked young, but she couldn't really, she said he seemed old and young at the same time. I remember her saying that he seemed old and young at the same time, but she couldn't really see his features well because his face was so bright. So this is very significant. When my daughter said this to me and I was reading the Bible, I said, my goodness, Moses was transformed on the earth without a rapture. The Bible also tells us later when he dies that he died full of strength. He had no sickness. He was, he was well. God just told him, Hey, you know, I'm about to take your life. And then he just died. And he's not the only one, you know, that same thing is encountered with other men of God in the Bible. They, God let them live these extraordinary lives full of all these abilities. And then he would just tell them, Hey, you're going to die tomorrow. And they just died. And Moses was definitely one of them. So he was an extraordinary man. Probably, you know, the greatest abilities in the Bible probably was exhibited with Moses. You know, but definitely he was um, at the top. He was definitely at the top. So next I want to talk about Joshua. Joshua was a warrior. The Bible tells us that in Joshua chapter 6 and 8 and in chapter 11. If you want to go read about him as a warrior. But what is extraordinary about him mostly is the fact that he had the ability to control the sun. Joshua was so powerful and bold with God that he commanded the sun to stand still and it did. Okay. Then this is Joshua 10, 12 through 14. Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the, in the sight of Israel, son, stand thou still upon Gibeon and thou moon in the valley of Agilon. And the sun stood still and the moon stayed until the until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. 
is not this written in the book of Joshua? Okay, so the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hasted not to go down about a whole day. And there was no day like that before it or after it that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man for the Lord fought for Israel. So Joshua commands it and the Lord allows it. And I do want to point out that there is reference to that to read the book of Joshua. So, you know, anybody saying that, you know, we shouldn't read it. it is The Bible is actually even pointing to you to read it. So, but anyway, this man had that ability, which is extraordinary. You know, a lot of these superheroes, they are really just copying off what they read from the Bible. Because the devil knows these things. The devil sees these things. And they're making these superheroes based on real characters, real biblical characters. And Samson. Samson had immense strength and he was also a judge. Okay, the Bible tells us that he was a judge in Judges 15, 20, and he judged Israel in the days of the Philistines 20 years. Okay, well, with this immense strength, he killed a thousand Philistines at one time with a donkey's jawbone. He ripped up the city's gates and carried them 30 miles away. Okay, can you imagine carrying all the city's gates 30 miles away, depositing them on a hill? He killed 30 men and stole their clothes to give as a reward to a group of dudes who figured out his riddle. He killed a lion barehanded, and of course he pushed over the pillars that held up the temple of Dagon, killing himself and 3,000 other people. Just um, supernaturally uh, strong, you know, definitely the, the Hulk is uh, copying off of people like Judah and Samson. Okay, so this video is over an hour long already, so I'm going to cut it short right now. But I want to remind everybody that this is only part one of the Old Testament. So I plan to do part two of the Old Testament next. Stay tuned. Um, there was some really extraordinary things here that you've seen already. And there is surely more to come. Some very amazing gifts that God has given me the knowledge to release. God bless you all.